This is uh, Henrik Linder of the band Dirty Loops. Come on. Come on. For those of you that don't know, they 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 rose to prominence their genuine YouTube phenomenon. They uh, they did these incredible loopified versions of pop songs, and they're just stunning, uh, you know, musicianship and virtuosity and. And since then, they have a record with, with a bunch of original material. And I had the good fortune of interviewing him for the bass player cover story. And I'm going to facilitate a little Q&A here. So I think we're just going to mostly open it up to you guys and, uh, and ask away. Hendrik Linder, everybody. Come on. Turn yeah, so bring out your questions and don't be shy. Yes. Uh, a little bit, like I, I checked out some of the, especially James Jamerson's things and try to like uh, do those things uh, when I grew up and everything, but I think most bass players somehow has Motown influences, so yeah, absolutely. Henrik, how did you, I have a question. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering how you went from um, internationally unknown uh, session musicians in Sweden to, uh, to getting all this success online. I think the, the common theory is that you guys had this big strategy, you know, this internet social media strategy, but I know that wasn't the case, right? Yeah, what happened was that we put up the video as a booking reference, the first one, and then those videos spread more and more because of people that share them. And uh, that's really, we had no strategy whatsoever, so that was really the reason why it happened, so yeah. we were very happy about that. And they were just friends of yours at school? Yeah, right? yeah, they were long-time friends, all of them. Yes? Uh, when I saw you guys' video, uh, obviously you guys made uh, Britney Spears sound good, and it was amazing, <laughs> but did you guys, did it looked like you guys played live in the video. Was that recorded after? Yeah, it was recorded after. But you can check out if we can do it live on the live shows. They can. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, any one of you like. Okay, you go first. Uh, when uh, you guys were doing your covers um, to reconstruct it, did you guys first take the melody? Or how did you guys uh, begin to uh, look at it when you guys did your covers? Uh, it was a little different for um, all of the covers, but uh, the thing that kind of was in common was just, a, as you said, like we stripped everything but the melody and then like cr try to create a completely new groove over it. So it was, uh, you could, for the later ones we did, we downloaded an acapella and sat with it and uh, rearranged it and tried to get a vision of it first and then kind of everything fell into place. So. Yes. Two-part question. Is that a slap ramp on there, and will you play us on it? Uh, yeah, it's a slap uh, ramp. Can you explain what that does for you? Um, why do you use yeah, that? Yeah, it's just so you so the fingers doesn't sink in too deep, like because yeah, it's especially like if you if you do those kind of things, it's nice that the fingers don't go down too low, like there there's too much action there. Mm -hmm. um, I know you're you uh, went to the uh, Academy of Music in Stockholm, and as did the, your your bandmates in in Dirty Loops. Can you talk about how much your back, your formal music education, you know, was kind of critical to you guys doing what you do now. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we went actually to several schools together, so I've been knowing them for a very long time. So we went to uh, music school together before that, and me and Jonah went to music school together even before that, since I was 11 and he was nine. That's when we met the first time, so it was a long time ago. But especially on the Royal Academy of Music, yeah, the uh, last two years, you could kind of set up your own thing. So I think all three of us made the most of it so we could pick the lessons we wanted to have and then pick our own strategy and how we wanted to practice and stuff like that, which was very useful to us. And what were some of the things, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the many striking things about Dirty Loops is, is your technique. Um, you obviously use a ton of different techniques. So 
Can you talk somewhat about why and how you developed that stuff? It was basically because the other guys wanted me to play stuff on the songs. It's a rare thing with their loops. When I tracked some of the bass things, they were like, no, no, it's not enough. Like, you need to add more stuff to it, which basically never happened to me uh, anywhere else. But uh, <laughs> And then they were like, yeah, I want you to play this thing, and I want you to do this. And then I, then I couldn't do it with the standard, uh, like, uh, like this, so, so I had to tilt my hands and and do like um, uh, yeah a different thing I mainly use four techniques with their loops so the one is the normal with the fingers and then the palm mute do you use the thumb and the first two fingers? Uh, thumb and, and the three, one, two, three. Uh, that's kind of like also for Stuff like that, and uh, yeah, then it's slap, and then uh, a little bit of tapping as well. But I really suck at tapping. <laughs> yes. What's the uh, from all? I mean, you're obviously very good, but what, what's the hardest thing you have to play on a on a regular set on your lap tour? What is there? Is there like a piece or like a lick or something that's like the hardest thing that you always like? Uh, I don't know. Like. The thing I screwed up the most uh, on the tour is the lick in circus that I did like over and over, but it just happened recently that I started to mess it up for like the three last shows. So it was like, like it sounded like that. But uh, I, I think the song Accidentally in Love was the one uh, that I had to practice the most because it's this 12-8 uh, groove where everything is on the offbeat, so it was more like the feel of the groove that was not there from the beginning that I had to practice a lot, so that was the hardest song for me to play. I know that you and the drummer worked um, a lot on just coming up together on, on grooves, and you would just pick a groove and just loop it and loop it and loop it, so can you talk about that? And yeah, we had this practice routine when we went to the Royal Academy of Music to have a two-bar groove and loop that two-bar groove for half an hour, take a break for five minutes, loop it again for half an hour, minute, and break for five minutes, and then again for half an hour, and then change to another groove. And then we did the same two grooves for a week uh, at once to kind of like just practicing to lock together. So it was not a technical thing. It was usually like uh, we set BPM or like different shuffle grooves that we had problems with to try to lock with each other. That was really good. So we did that five nights a week for some years, so that was really good. And that's like no fills, no very. No, no, that was against the nothing. rules. Like, yeah. uh, uh, he was always the one that could like keep it up for the longest, and I started to do things, and then he got mad at me. And <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Uh, yes. Yeah, I just go there. Do, you, do you have some tracks or anything to play? I'd love to hear you play. Yeah, we will. Pl I will play with uh, later at uh, a word thing. Uh, at the what ceremony. Do you have anything? I mean, I, I'd really love to hear you play some of the actual bass lines. Uh, yeah, I could try to play some of the bass lines, but I don't have any tracks right now. But uh, yeah, I don't know, like I could play the second verse of Hit Me or something yeah, like that. Play. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> first I think yeah anyone could you talk about your bass for a minute I saw you playing earlier at the EDS booth and I noticed some of the frets are uneven could you talk about what the bass is yeah it's uh, is an invention called true temperament so it's basically a different temperation which makes uh, the guitar uh, the guitar keys more in tune but I found the other keys also be more in tune than 
a regular basis. I don't know how well this is tuned because we just intoned it. I got this bass today, so. But uh, it's uh, for especially the thirds and sixths uh, like makes a big difference towards straight frets, I think. Uh, and uh, also, it's better in tune, like in the higher register. So it's it's useful like that, I think. Do you guys know what temperament is? Is everyone familiar? Raise your hand if you know what temperament is. Yeah, but it's this thing like uh, I don't. I gotta get it right myself. I could. I mean, I could. I could. Yeah. But if you stab if, if you tune a piano like totally clean, yeah, you could basically just play in one key. So it was Bach, I think, that had the whole temper. Uh, piano thing and this is a different kind of temperation than that so that's basically what it is yeah it's like you take an octave and you divide it into 12 equal piece that's equal temperament that's what we all use but you end up with thirds that aren't really true thirds and sixths that aren't really yeah. true sixths the guy, that did, the guy that did the frets would probably be mad at me for explaining <laughs> it wrong now but <laughs> it works for me uh, yes yeah I was just wondering who's writing all the chords for this uh, we do it together, but obviously Jonah, like uh, our keyboard player, ha does the most of it. So, but uh, yeah, we do a lot of the chords together as well. So, yes, uh, whoever was first. The one. Yeah. Okay. Um, when thrown into a situation where you have to play d in different time signatures and different meters, like how how do you take a stab at that to establish groove? Uh, first of all, I really suck at playing odd meters, but I had to do it uh, with a fusion group a lot. So the thing I wanted to do was uh, to sit with a drummer and play the grooves over and over so I could kind of feel the time signature. And uh, to be natural in it, like if I was playing 3-4 four or 4-4 four, four or something like that. So I think uh, one thing that you want to do in the beginning, that I did at least, that was kind of a mistake, is that you try to play over odd meters and try to like do as complicated stuff rhythmically all the time just because it's odd meters instead of just playing like you would over a normal song and that was something I tried to work on. Yes? Uh, um. Sorry again. Go for it dude. So do you feel do you feel any pressure or need to like move somewhere like to LA or some other place? Because I know you know you're in Sweden and it's I mean, with the internet and everything, you know, you're, you got recognition, but do you feel like further any certain career ambitions? Do you feel like the need to, or are you guys just going to stay in Sweden? Uh, I don't, I don't really know. Like, we, I think we traveled more days than we've been at home, so we we're constantly somewhere, anywhere. So the last year doesn't really felt like we needed to stay anywhere because we stayed at a hotel or airports the most of the year. I would say that they did better than almost everybody and they were in Sweden so they kind of they proved the point that you don't need to be in Los Angeles to, they got a record deal all that from Sweden oh uh, yeah I don't know who was first but yeah I just have a question so your guys group has this new like hyper pocket you know like you guys play so damn tight yeah but is there any embellishments that you do do or that you feel comfortable or do you just play the game as straight as you possibly can and perfect you know? I don't know, it depends on the hearing and everything, like some gigs are better than other, obviously, and some gigs, other stuff happens, like there's some parts of the arrangements that are totally written, and there, then there are some that change for every gig as well, because otherwise I don't think it would be that fun to play it, but uh, did that answer your question at all? Much. <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, when I started, I listened to Flea from the Red Chili Peppers a lot, and uh, then I went on to the fusion thing, so one of my main idols is uh, Gary Willis from Tribal Tech, uh, that I'm actually going to play with later today, so I'm really looking forward to that as a dream come true, but yeah, I guess there's a lot of the players that are here tonight is people I listened to when I grew up, so there's really a lot of them. Anthony Jackson, Marcus Miller, Vicky Rudin, like I could, the list would go be very long. Um, I'd like to get, a, dive a little deep into um, some, of, some of your concepts around harmony and, and, and chords and stuff. Um, you, you integrate a lot of chords, obviously on six string you, you, you have more ability to do that. So can you walk us through some of your, kind of where you began as far as developing root voicings and then how you expanded on that? 
Yeah, I think one the thing I started with was like playing uh, different modes and like do it in thirds or fifths or seven like oh. like stuff like that. That's how I started, I guess, with the chords and and then uh, yeah, like add more notes. So you would take a you would take a mode oh. to just like play off the scales, I guess was the thing and then you find voicings that you like and after that you could kind of change the scale so uh, I work with Joan a lot with that because uh, during my solos that I would just play like the root and the third so I could kind of go wherever I wanted harmonically doing some passages of that so if you for instance has like this or a C major it leaves you the option to go like go a lot of ways so um, there's a ton of things you could do like if you ask the keyboard player to not like play a cluster voicing that you can accept to deal with so i think that's an important thing for bass player at least it's been for me is there some kind of conceptual um tip you have to 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 develop rootless voicings like do you think of it as like a triad that's related to the root in some way or yeah, I did a lot of the upper structure triads as well because those are very... I, I started listening to the Brecker Brothers and stuff like that and then like I recognized the voicings from there so I just thought like those things like... Yeah, they sound... Yeah. They sounded nice like the upper structure triads. It's just like a sound that I like but... Yeah, yeah another thing that's, that I think is important is to like kind of... Uh, if you have a voicing like, maybe switch it around so it's uh, like, where there's a flat nine in between those things. I like those kind of voicings because they, I think they sound good, but. So do you have a lot of dominant chord voicings in particular? Uh, oh, those were all like minors and mm -hmm. major. I think I'm better over the major, sev major seven and minor, minor seven, seven or stuff like that. But yeah, there's. stuff you can do I guess but that that beginning part maybe for someone who's not quite at that level was taking a scale and playing like the diatonic yeah tenths uh, yeah and thirds or sixth or whatever or sixth any interval cool so that's a good way to start I think I remember you showed me a really cool uh, warm-up also, can you share that with? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's one thing I used to do a lot. That's also like kind of over modes. That if I do it in C major, for instance, you play the first arpeggio to C major seven, the scale down, and then the next the D minor seven. And then you get all the modes of the thing, and then you could. Uh, change it to whatever mode you're in and actually you can start from every position and then you will learn the neck that way that's that i found is a useful exercise any questions on that guys i know that was a lot of in info packed there's good stuff there so ask questions yes uh, basically you are, you are using the same root of the scale and just changing on, on the modes right yeah exactly so like the second one would be to start the entire thing on d or like uh, or if you would go like minor like a melodic minor. You can do it with everything like with harmonic major. And uh, yeah, then you could learn a lot of scales, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of useful. Am I really loud, by the way? Or is it, okay. Cool. Questions? Yes, so. Do you, do you always play a six string? Uh, yeah, most of the time, right now. Um, I started out with a four string, then went to five, then to six, then to seven, and then back to six again, so. Yes? What brand were your first couple of bases? 
Uh, I had a 70s Ibanez in the beginning, that was my first bass, and the second one was a Yamaha TRB6P. Uh, actually, I had a 5P first, and then I went to the 6P, so I, uh, I had two Yamaha basses. I thought they, I think they're really great basses as well. I still have, I still have that one. Why yes. Why the switch from seven to six? Uh, my hands are too small, <laughs> so the B string kept ringing all the time, and it was. Uh, I think it, I thought it was hard to control the bass because the fretboard was too wide. I got really, really small hands. I remember you telling me something interesting about um, that you love Fenders and you love P basses and jazz basses, just not when you play them. That this is really your axe. Yeah, I guess so. Like uh, it would be a different thing, but it, there, there's a lot of those things. Like certain amps, I think, sound fantastic when other people play mm -hmm. them, but it just doesn't suit my playing because it's my fingers. Yeah. The way I play it doesn't sound nice in them. But I, I guess that would change as well. If I played a bass in that amp, I think I would adjust my fingers to that so that it would sound more like I wanted it to. So, and what is that? What do you What do you want your basses to sound like? I don't know, like with their loops that I play with now, I want it to be a hybrid because I want the notes to come out and at the same time I want it to sound good for slap as well. So it's kind of like a hybrid sound that works for both, uh, like a percussive, percussive, uh, yeah, finger playing and for slap as well. So. And you have a really interesting rig, I know, to kind of get at that tone with when you have your full on. Yeah, yeah, I play like the 80s guitar system rig, like it's a wet, dry, wet thing. So I have uh, one clean channel in the middle and all the stereo effects on two amps on the sides. So it could sound pretty big, like when you... And you're using it. the axe effects? The, the Yeah. The great thing about it also is that I use a lot of the EQ. So when I go between slap, finger, and palm mute, I could change the EQs for that to kind of even out the volume that I find is very useful. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you would have to push way harder. But this way, I could play the way I want. Do you guys know? Are you familiar with the Axe FX system? Yeah. Yeah. It's a multi effect that's all MIDI controllable and a lot of very sophisticated modulation and EQs and stuff. Yeah, it's basically for guitar also. Yeah, it's a guitar yeah. thing. Yes. Stay a trio uh, we have uh, a, an additional keyboard player when we play live. It's basically so Jonah could move around a little more and not stay stationary all the time. What about a, a guitar player? Does that, does that fit in music? Uh, it would be so much less to do for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, know, like maybe one day. I don't know. I remember uh, being sort of shocked to discover that. Uh, the first time that any of the music was ever uh, written out in charts or transcribed was because you had a, a keyboard player coming in that you guys all know this stuff. Cool. Yeah, he, he really, he got the files and like, here, go nuts. And then he had to transcribe everything. <laughs> so that was quite a work for him. He's a great guy, like a great friend as well and a great keyboard player. His name is Christian Kraftling. Questions, questions. Oh, yeah. Finger, finger picking technique, can you describe some of what you do? Yeah, the first one is like, I guess, the normal one with two fingers. Oh, this. Uh, this. Uh, it's basically because I started to develop it because Jonah and Aaron wanted me to play like the shuffle notes shorter, so it's. So I usually pick with my thumb and. Uh, is this, what's this, the, That's the, the, bad the finger. middle finger, the bad <laughs> finger. <laughs> yeah, so I usually use those, but uh, but it's it's nice also because you can play triplets and stuff like that with it, so. And uh, it's easy to like um, uh, get chords and stuff in there as well, so. It's nice. Could you leave them maybe with a with a simple way to develop that technique if they, if no one's really tried that yet? Maybe a little exercise. Yeah, one one thing is to like uh, keep uh, uh, what's, palm know, palm. Yeah, yeah, that's why it's called palm mute as well. So that's good, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then like uh, the thumb is kind of at the bottom, so it's basically a little bit like the slap technique. So. And then I guess just, just do it a lot. That's <laughs> what I did. <laughs> yes. Has that technique helped you with your slapping, or which one did you start first? Uh, I started with slapping. That was basically for things I couldn't do with 
playing with two fingers that I was too lazy to do. So then I invented another way of doing it. But I think a lot of players do that. I think I stole it from like Matthew Garrison or Hadrian for all. Like I seen them doing it way before me. So it's not something I came up with. The ramp does the ramp help a lot with that? Yeah, the ramp really helps with that. Otherwise, you should have a big pickup. I think like a humbucker pickup, so you could do it over that. So. Yes. Um, what are some things that you're working on right now to like keep improving? Because uh, in every video, uh, you do a good solo, good baseline, and and then it's like you keep getting better, you keep topping it, and you keep improving. And and what are some of the things you do to keep getting better? Mm. Uh, I try to develop new harmonical concepts. That's what I work on a lot. Like, uh, especially what I want to get into deeper is like learn more voicings and learn how to play with chords over other chords and stuff like that. So, it's it's uh, like for. It was a very helpful tip for me, like with uh, playing outside and stuff like that, that I got from a teacher when I was around twenty or something like that to play dominant so if you're in the key like if you play over c major for instance you could go like play in a7 or d7 because it leads to it so if you have like uh yeah i did uh, did it with major chords now but it's like uh, if you play like oh. Because it sound, uh, it it leads back to to the original key, and I think the outplaying makes more sense in that way. So that was, I you didn't ask for that, but I said that anyway. So, so Henry, can you be a little more specific? So like, let's say you're in C uh, major, and you said A seven and D seven. So uh, no, A flat seven. A flat, flat seven. Oh, yeah, oh, so okay. it's a tritone substitute. Okay. So uh, yeah, it's basically they play uh, Lydian flat seven from D flat, uh, D flat seven. So you play like, uh, which is just a tritone substitute dominant. So you play over that mode, over it, because it leads back to the original key. So I think that's a cool thing, cool way to think about that. That makes sense, everybody? No? Raise your hands if that made sense. Cool. It's like 50%. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's uh, that guy over there. He's responsible. The guy in the glasses and the beard. He made it. So it's a Swedish custom built bass uh, called Madison Bass, and Madison is his name. So I think it's a great bass. It's the first time I ever touched it today, but uh, it's uh, my signature model, and this is the one with the maple fretboard and the birch instead of whatever it is on the other one. Wenji. Wenji. <laughs> what is the fretboard? Is it Wenji as well? Yeah. yeah, it's it's good to keep track of your equipment. <laughs> I know you, you're a huge uh, Brecker fan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can you talk about um, some of the things that, that studying Michael Brecker brought to your playing and what it is you admire about his playing, his concept. Yeah, I don't know, like, I didn't transcribe him that much. Like, I guess one of the things I do is the minor six pentatonics that he kind of did a, a little bit, but, like, he's way more complex than I am, <laughs> harmonically. Than, than but, anyone, But uh, those, like... Can yeah, you, play, yeah, like, you play that, like, 50%? Yeah, it's just like, It's basically just a minor pentatonic, but you lower the seven to the six, so it's like all all of those are notes from the tones from the Dorian scale. But uh, if you just like, yeah. And how would you correlate that to, to like a tonal center? So so. Yeah, it's just like over. You could you could play them like from any step, like with pentatonics. You could play them basically from a lot of steps, mm -hmm. from a lot of modes. But uh, if you're in C minor, for instance, it's just like like. Uh, the sixth in there mm -hmm. so it's not like a super fancy thing but <laughs> I still think it sounds pretty nice yeah. yes so oh, did, did you uh, listen to a lot of Jaco? yeah yeah absolutely is there any bass players that didn't 
What's your favorite Jocko tune? Oh, uh, yeah, I gotta think. Yeah, I guess one of the ones I played the most when I was a kid uh, was Come On, Come Over. I like the groove of that one, but yeah, I like... Oh, the Havon, Havon, Havona. Havona. Havona solo is also one of my favorite solos of all times, so... Yeah, that really inspired me a lot. So. Can you talk about what it was like going from uh, you know, achieving your notoriety, doing these covers, and then releasing your first record where every tune, but I think but one was was an original, right? Yeah, but two. But, but two. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was like kind of a transition. It took a while for us to learn how to do our own songs. So we basically, in the end, we started using the same concept to write simple pop songs and then rearrange them afterwards. So it, it's really the same thing, but there were bigger productions on this one. So we had to, had to bring another guy on the road to cover up. And what's that writing process like? you how's that what, what it was it a little bit different like we usually it's kind of a weird thing we always sit two and two so it's like in any constellation it's like me or aaron me or jonah or jonah and aaron that comes up with one part and then yeah the thing that's important first is to write the melody of the song and then after that you can kind of get a vibe for the rest of it and then arrange it afterwards but uh, so it always starts with the melody it doesn't start with a groove or yeah or some of them started with a groove idea also that's kind of like uh, Saying her love did start with that, and sexy girls started with that. Sexy girls has horrible lyrics, by the way, but yeah, in the club. Yeah, in the club. <laughs> Duck club. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Just stretching. Oh. Um, another thing I, I notice on the re on the record, uh, sorry, is um, it's definitely a unique hybrid of. The th I guess the, th the thing that we would all know as fusion in terms of the harmonic awareness and the virtuosity, but it's also very much like a contemporary pop record. Like there's a lot of EDM sounds and, and um, is that because that's all stuff you guys are into? Um, yeah, I, I guess we try to melt like everything we listen to into one thing. So there's a lot of, uh, I think with the voicings of the core that Jonah, of the record that Jonah did, it's his classical background is in there a lot as well. So with all the chords, like uh, it's a really, like he really thought out the voice leading of those. So that was important as well, I think. You had a question? Yeah, I did. Go ahead. So I'm still looking forward to one of your live shows, but I haven't seen, when do you use the capo? On what uh, the capo was just for a bass I had before that was two frets too long to make it tune like a normal six string. So there were no real practical use anymore for it because now I would just put it behind the first fret. So <laughs> it was only for that. So it was not that I wanted to play stuff with open strings up here or something like that. So. And do you slide that that uh, mute up to dead and open strings when you're when you're playing? High stuff. What do, you, what do you use that for? Do you play this behind one, uh, it? Uh, this is just because I got sloppy right hand techniques to damp the to strings. damp the open strings. So it doesn't sound when I'm, when I'm up on the C string, so I don't have to. Uh, I should work on that. You're, you're good. Man. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Very much. Yeah, I should mention him, mention him more because yeah, absolutely, I think he's fantastic. Yes. Uh, you have some some of your songs solo bass solo. Do you do you write those or are those improvisations? And in the live shows, do you do the same solos or you improvise over the songs? It's different. Like some of the uh, solos for the record were absolutely rhythm, but that was kind of. Uh, pieces like that, with, that included tapping or slap. Uh, but uh, yeah, most solos on the live shows are uh, impro improvised. It's just uh, for sexy girls and stuff like that, but it's kind of like the solo is like a rhythm piece of the of the song. Then I, then I play the same thing, but play the same thing every night. But for a baby or baby or just dance, or uh, yeah, we added a bass solo to just dance that's obviously improvised as well. So it's it's a mixture. Obviously, you're someone that has shedded, would shed it a lot in your in your time. Um, do you still practice? And if so, what? 
Yeah, I try to, but like when you're on the road, it's hard. Like the latest thing I practiced was the songs I'm gonna play today because we have a one hour rehearsal before we go on. So <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I try to practice when I have time. So I want to keep developed. So so what's the typical Hendrik Lindner practice? Yeah, uh, I play over tunes mostly and try to come up with new concepts. I usually sit with the same tunes for a very long time. So it's yeah, the same standards. Standards and, and stuff. Yeah, I play uh -huh. standards. Usually then, but uh, yeah, I would not call myself a great jazz player whatsoever. And are you playing along with like a play along, or did you play? Do you sequence out the chords? Or yeah, you... it's a mixture. Like some songs I have done sequence myself, and then I have some play alongs that I like as well. So. What are some of those tunes? Uh, yeah, I play Giant Steps a lot, and mm -hmm. the Star by Starlight, and Days of Wine and Roses. Like they're like the normal, standards, I guess. So there's. The songs I know basically, and then I try to have songs that has slightly different harmonical concepts of them. So, how how uh, valuable? I I know that um, before Dirty Loops took off, you were uh, playing a lot of sessions uh, at home. How valuable was that experience having to play all these different styles of music and and be prepared and be versatile? Yeah, I guess like uh, you try to make the most of it everywhere you came and. Uh, some sessions were better than others, so yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, it's been valuable to play a lot of things, absolutely. Because, yeah, it's the same thing. I think it's good to listen to a lot of different music, also, to approach the things you want to learn from as many angles as possible. So, it's it's been good. Yes, um, what's your take on dissonance, and how would you um, use it to embellish like your soloing or like melody? Dissonance, uh, yeah, I think it's like hard with a word like this dissonance because it means different things to a lot of people. Like some people think a major seven is dissonant. Like well, I necessarily wouldn't think that, but uh, yeah, uh, it's a thing like turning. Uh, I guess it's a dissonance when you do like voicings that has this interval in them, the flat nine interval that I really like. In if you have a like major seven chord with the major seven in, in as the root or stuff stuff like that, those chords are they're pretty chords, but uh, I guess they're kind of dissonant in a way. Your questions? Come on, somebody's got a question. Yes. Do <laughs> you have any side projects coming up or anything? I know you're busy, but... You have any... uh, I'm gonna play my younger brother is recording a fusion album, so I'm gonna record that when I get home from tour in December, so this is gonna be fun. What does he play? Guitar. What would you recommend to a, uh, a person coming up as... as as far as the key things to pay attention to as they're developing as musicians? I think one thing is the practice routine that's important because I think a lot of people count, get stressed and count the hours they practice instead of like, yeah, I've been good today because I've been in a room for eight hours, not necessarily getting the most out of it. Like sometimes it's better to have a half an hour when you practice something that you really want to learn and to develop a goal of what you want to sound like. I think that's an important thing to pay attention to. How did you, when you were really in your intense shedding period, did you divide up your time in a kind of organized way like that? No, it was, I was in school with Aaron and we basically started uh, practicing at 8 p.m. Till, until the school closed and then I went home to practice some more and then I usually overslept the first lessons and, and then it was kind of the same thing. Like, uh, I guess both of me and him had like a 26 hour routine because we turned the clock all the time, so I could call him at like 4 a.m. in the morning. I actually woke him up at 4 p.m. and he asked, and he was like, what time is it? I was like, 4 p.m. or a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah, it, it was problem. really like that wow. when, uh, because I don't know, like uh, it was dark all the time in Sweden as well. So <laughs> you must encourage people to really shed. Yeah, but it was not that we practiced all the time. It was just like the routine we had when right. we were in school, so. Yes? Um, for your like personal mix live, what do you like to have more in your mix? 
Uh, I like to have a kick drum. That's important. And also, I want to have uh, both keyboard players, like so I could hear the harmony and everything. Like because uh, they play the bass lines when I do solo, so I want to hear that as well, so I know where I am. So, but. Other than that, like I try to have an even mix of everything, and then add the bass like over that, kind of like a rehearsal uh, situation because you sit in front of your amp and uh, like to have that kind of thing that's as close to that as possible. The things you're used to. Yes. Yes, I, I caught your show in Nashville. I was curious. Do you guys use sequences on any of the stuff? Or is it all just kind of on the fly, everybody's... No, we use a lot of sequence. Uh, we have click tracks, and then we have we have percussion loops on a lot of songs. And then uh, then there are like some of the EDM parts that we could, like someone could sample them, but they're just easier to have in the tracks that are just like noise things. So is, is that, is that, uh, is that controlled from a computer off stage, or are you, are you guys using uh, audio tracks, or how does that? No, it's uh, it's from a computer. Oh. The computer also. The great thing about it is, since it's run by click track, it changes my sounds on on stage as well. So I have like, if I have one slap in the middle of something, I could have a different EQ for just that note that kind of pops by itself. And that's that MIDI effect system that. John yeah. Was talking about. Exactly. That's great. Yeah, that's that's a, that's really helpful. It's a good thing. Like if you play the click tracks, not all of the songs are by click. Like some we play by ourselves as well. So then I have to stomp myself. But yeah, so there, there's a control change in the in the sequence of the MIDI controller yeah. telling your effects unit to yeah. to switch to the wow. How long did it take to program that, man? Uh, I did it in one night. It was the day before the tour. Uh, it was kind of intense. Like both me and the guy that helped uh, setting up everything, we didn't sleep for two whole days like doing all those things because we had rehearsals. We only had three days to rehearse the entire show. So it was really that we had to walk, uh, work around the clock. So I was exhausted afterwards. I ate the same like shitty burgers they had around there. It was, uh, tasted like rubber. So. <laughs> Yes. What kind of recording tools do you use? Oh yeah, this is kind of a funny thing. Uh, the drums are recorded in Pro Tools, the keyboards and uh, and the vocals are recorded in Logic, and I record my bass in Cubase. So. <laughs> and yeah. then, you, then, all, then it was all mixed to two inch. Yeah. yeah so we. I would, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I recorded them in my dad's garage, the entire album. So I had uh, a preamp and just a DI straight to the board. So. so all your parts were overdubbed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we didn't have a studio. We didn't even have the arrangements like completely set when we recorded stuff, so. Yes? What was your reasoning behind recording in different um, digital audio workstations and everything? It was the uh, systems we were comfortable with. I always used Cubase because I had a PC at home. Jonah had a Mac, so he used Logic. And Aaron recorded at a professional studio where they used Pro Tools, so... And then we just sent the WAV files. It was mixed in Cubase also. Yes? Oh. Oh, sorry. Now, just for your live stuff, do you guys use Ableton or what? Uh, no, we use uh, a program called QLab. QLab? Yeah, it was just because we wanted to have the media changes, because we the second keyboard player uses the same thing, so he doesn't have to change his sounds either. So you can concentrate on playing instead of stomping. So it's cool. Did, did that workflow change when you guys started working with with David Foster? And, you know. Uh, not really. David Foster's only tip that he gave us was add more hits and more chords. <laughs> but yeah, you were at the Nashville show. That's the first time the MIDI thing screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was that why it was delayed? Or? No, no, no. That was not why it was delayed. But it was in the middle. Of, I wasn't. I didn't play half of Circus because it changed to program number six hundred. So I had to like yeah. manually flip it down to thirty four or something oh, like that. So, <laughs> and then it made a lot of noise as well because there was some like synthesizer like. <laughs> yeah. These are the risks. It sounded a whole lot worse to you on stage than it did out front. Yeah, the, the, the keyboard players started like playing bass, so <laughs> they filled in for me. 
you use some other effects. I mean, it's not it's not only just EQ changes, right, and, and gain changes. No, no, absolutely not. Like it's a lot of delays and stuff like that, and a lot of weird effects that the XFX has as well. So I think it's it's really cool. Like you could really create your own sounds in it. So. I remember you describing this really insane delay modulation. Yeah, yeah created. I stole it from Alan Holdsworth. So I downloaded his patch, his patches. It's kind of like the swell thing that you control with a volume pedal. So it's uh, two delays on each side that feedbacks into two additional delays, and then there's modulation like chorus on all of them, and then it creates, and then you take away the attack, and then it becomes like this, like big swelling thing that he does. It sounds better when he does it, but it's still fun for me to do it as well. So I use that on like four or five songs on the live show. Have you always been in, in, into effects and inspired by effects? No, like uh, it's been with their loops that I started developing it more. Uh, when I practice and stuff, I only brought a bass, so. Questions, guys? Go ahead, in front. Do you use pedals? Uh, yeah, I have uh, a volume pedal and a taper and an envelope filter as well and then the MIDI floorboard for the Axe FX. So that's their rig. Yes? Um, when looking for a new bass to play, what type of wood do you go for? What sound, like do you want a dark or bright sound, warm? Or... I wanted to have one of each. So uh, as I told you, the first one of the, the one I've been playing on tour is Benji, and this is maple and birch, a Swedish kind of birch that's from the northern part of Sweden called moss or birch. It's kind of like, you know, yeah, looks like this. And then it's Swamp Bash, I think, also. And Benji? Alder. Alder? Yeah. It's great that you're here. <laughs> How important is it to you to have a relationship with, with the person who's building your instruments? It's been awesome because like, we've been trying a lot of models back and forth. And like, yeah, I like this thing about this bass and this thing about that bass so and then he could always sell them so the bass i played on baby and rolling in the deep is here and that's going to be for sale so if someone is interested in that one so then pick it up it's the hit machine yeah questions guys right here when's your next live show tomorrow where st louis uh, cool. <laughs> how about in la uh, in a week or something, the 17th at San the farm. Yeah. Yes. Sorry to ask about your tour, but, or like so many dates and everything. When do you guys come to Vegas? Uh, it's uh, a day or two before San Diego. So the 14th or? Is it dirtyloops.com? What's, the, what's your. <laughs> so yeah, with, <laughs> what's with your, your website? <laughs> yeah, dirty. Consult the web. Yeah, it's on the web. Like, but uh, the Las Vegas show is in a week or something like that. I don't know what date is. It's the eighth today, so it's in six or five or four days or something like that. So soon. What was it like having come up, um, making you know, records in the way you did, to then be signed to this major and to be working with someone like David Foster? I mean, tell tell us about that transition. How that felt. Yeah, I, I don't know, like, uh, it didn't change that much. We basically said that we wanted to do a lot of things ourselves when we signed the deal and everybody agreed on that. So the things it did was that it came with like tips and stuff like that. They actually been really helpful and I'm really happy to work with them, but it's not that they changed the music in any way. So that still came from us. Yes? What are your future goals for the uh, right now, I guess, after this, is to write another record and um, keep touring and to keep developing with the band to find new things to do with it. So to not make the same records over and over to kind of like, uh, yeah, go different places. Yeah. What instrument do you write on? Uh, piano, mostly. Like some things I did on bass. The intro for Wake Me Up I did on bass, but basically everything else on piano. How important, how, uh, maybe you can uh, convince people here who aren't playing any piano, how important is it to you to be able to have a little bit of piano to figure things out? 
I thought it was really helpful because you could see harmony from a different perspective. I, th I always think it's good for everything to be able to see it from uh, as many perspective as possible, perspectives as possible, so, yeah. You play any key bass? No, I did it before. I actually, I want to build a bass that has a MIDI keyboard there's, attached to it. There's so. a guy making those. Have you seen yeah. it? There's a guy doing that. Oh, really? Yeah, it's got a little MIDI controller on it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I have to talk to him how yeah, he's he, doing it. I think he calls it the key base, actually. So. Key base, yeah. Anyone else? Cool, everybody. Well, thank Henrik Lindner for... Thank you so much. Let's stick around. You want to play a little something out? You got like a, a minute of stuff for us? Prepared any solo things. I understand so how comfortable it can be. Noodle. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.